All right, so um, our next speaker is uh, Raul Banerjee, and uh, uh, Professor Banerjee uh, received his PhD from the University of uh, Hyderabad in India in uh, 2006. Uh, he was also a postdoc uh, at UCLA in this kind of magical end of the 2000 uh, era, um, uh, along with several of us. Uh, and uh, after that period, he, he uh, joined uh, the CSIR National Chemical Laboratory in, uh, uh, in uh, Pune, India. Um, and he is currently an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research uh, in uh, Kolkata, uh, India. Uh, his research uh, includes the study of uh, structural chemistry and chemical synthesis to design porous materials. Uh, he has uh, really established a very vibrant and uh, an active research program uh, ever since uh, starting his independent career. He's a recipient of uh, many awards, uh, you know, really too many to, to list individually, um, but um, the uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say he's he's the a recent recipient of the Shant, uh, the Shanti Swarup uh, Botniger Prize for Science and Technology and the DST Swarma Gianti Fellowship, uh, among many many others. Um, he is also a associate editor of uh, the the top uh, chemistry journal Chemical Science and a, a fellow of the of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Banerjee and. Uh, uh, Raul, you can go ahead and uh, share share your slides and begin your presentation. Thank you so very much, Will, and for this very kind introduction. Thank you also very much uh, to Omar and the other organizers uh, for their kind kind invitation. Uh, on the very outset, I would like to express uh, my sincere gratitude uh, for this online uh, meeting uh, because this is also a good opportunity for uh, students and young researchers in India to listen to the world leaders in chemistry, chemical engineering, material science, and so on and so forth. So this is an excellent platform and I shall most certainly I have uh, already enjoyed Bo's lecture. I mean, I have been, I'm, I worked with Bo when I was a postdoc. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting and the, in future, as and when I get an opportunity, I will also attend uh, these uh, wonderful meetings by, uh, organized by the Northwestern University. Okay, so today we are going to discuss about uh, some porous materials uh, where uh, Bo Wang, my colleague, uh, has already given some introduction but so I will make it short and brief. So what we are trying to, going to, dis, uh, trying to discuss today is that something about the spheres, films and membranes, it's completely organic in nature. So I will explain it to you how it is, why it is challenging, what exactly is the uh, research activity and, and how we will try to overcome it. So if we think about uh, the regular porous materials that we encounter every day, uh, we would like to mention a few, for example, zeolites, porous carbon, porous polymers, these are some of these. And if you think about it, and if you, if you look into their literature, if you look into the science, you will see that these materials are, do have a simple uh, or the common technique or common feature among them. They are inexpensive, they are crystalline, most of them porous carbon, non porous polymer is not so much. They're chemically stable, it's very important. Uh, and also you can make it very quickly and you can give it a lot of different shapes and sizes. So these are the common commonalities that you see in these materials. Now, if we keep that in perspective today, what we are going to discuss something about a different type of organic structures, which uh, these organic structures are very simple in nature. So if you take a simple organic molecule, for example, uh, diamine, and a trialdehyde, if you react them together, you do get this nice, beautiful two-dimensional organization. You are supposed to get like that. You expect it to be like that. If you do get is this kind of beautiful organization, then what will, should happen is that like graphene to graphite, these two-dimensional layered structures should stack up on top of each other and eventually create 
a beautiful porous architecture as you can see very nice pores and these porous structures are called covalent organic framework they are very simple in nomenclature because they are covalent in nature they are organic and eventually you can make a framework out of it so that's why you call them as covalent organic framework you precipitate them as crystalline powders and uh, and you can of, of course utilize these materials for multiple different purposes so that we have already discussed uh, so far today so this is a very simple synthesis of this material the way you can make it the why these materials became so popular because uh, first of all you can choose different building blocks and if you choose different building blocks use different organic synthesis uh, as i have uh, picked up from the internet some of these reported uh, by other groups all over the world including wills and uh, so you if you pick up all these different synthetic methods you can create a lot of diverse architecture which is which is exemplary in their own feature so that's what these the beauty of this material materials are there is a very important part about the synthesis that not every synthetic method will will produce this covalent organic framework though we expect it to be but uh, you need to have a fairly reversible uh, reactions and also please make a note of these uh, important ingredient that is the water that you use to balance out or or you you fine tune the reversibility remember reversibility is required to achieve the crystallinity you need crystallinity to know what you have made Now, otherwise you really don't know what you have made so if you wish to fine tune it it will be very difficult for you unless you know the internal structure and obviously because of these beautiful features these materials have picked up attention there are papers after papers and in publications all over the world and uh, different groups and used it for multiple different purposes so these materials have really picked up attention and last 5 years it was i mean it was a really ex i mean you know pleasing to see that these materials have picked up lot of attention now coming back to it all these are beautiful stuff whatever i told but what is the challenge the challenge is when you try to make these materials or try to organize these materials the way you wish to like this nice pi pi stack with pores over here they are not school children so if you don't expect them to line up the way you want when you try to make them very quickly or in a rapid ma manner they will completely randomly organize and eventually you will get a material which is completely amorphous and non porous uh, in nature so that is going to be a big problem so you wish to have this thermodynamic structure you are eventually getting this kinetic product which you do not wish to have so we 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 tried out multiple alternatives and we figured out that uh, and also when i was a postdoc i used to see this uh, see this freeze pump thaw cycle what we uh, what me and my colleagues used to use to make this thermodynamic structure stable or to achieve the thermodynamic structure and bypass this kinetic product as much as possible i really do not wish to discuss more about it because it is really a brutal technique absolutely not viable either to industry or anything you can probably get tiny amount of material pure material uh, which is good to understand the properties but otherwise they are literally this method is really not good for anything because it only gives you milligram scale product after 3 to 7 days of brutal heating under uh, uh, evacuated condition flame sealed and then uh, you break the seal and so on and so forth so it is really not viable so these are uh, challenges i think we have fairly understood what are the challenges so you need to make the materials in 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 quickly these you know milligram scale products are not going to be of any use and you have to have something chemically stable and flexible and so on and so forth all right so before uh, we started the work people have already realized that there is a challenge in these covalent organic structures because they are you know boronic acid condensation products or boraxin ring condensation products so there was this you know challenge of the chemical stability today i am not i will refrain from uh, uh, discussing it because i have i have discussed it in multiple forums so there was this issue that you know if I, if you produce something via reversible reaction there is always a chance that it will go back to the starting material from the product so your if your product is the polymer you can always go back to the monomer so what we did is we uh, we needed this reversible reaction because remember without reversibility it is very challenging to get any crystallinity whatsoever 
So we use this very simple technique, uh, which we have published uh, several years ago, where we put these three hydroxy functionalities next to an aldehyde, and uh, which helped us to, to sort of uh, made a, a you know, tautomeric, re you know, reversible and irreversible feature. So this is the first reversible step where you will see this C double bond end, they are chemically labile functionality, not that much stable. So, but we need those to organize and crystallize uh, these products. So what we did is we, we introduced those, but we use these hydroxy functionalities to simply tautomerize. You can see these hydroxy functionalities simply tautomerize the structure. And eventually now you get a very nice two dimensional layered product where you have no bond, which can be hydrolyzed by, by simple organic or other mineral acids. And so, you know, this is the objective that we picked up. We have not discovered it. This was already reported in the literature that if you react to salicylaldehyde with aniline, you will get a in all product, whereas you do the same thing with, uh, with, the, with that fluorogucinol trialdehyde, you will get a keto product. So this is the Cambridge structural database product or Cambridge structural database structure, which we took it and we, we present it in the two dimensional uh, material. And then we could make a material which is stable in acid and base for one week. I mean, you know, I mean, and there is no, uh, no really um, stunning fact over here because uh, none of these bonds, except there is a little bit of acidity on the NH, these NH, what you can see. So that's why in strong base, some of that sometimes it is not very stable or otherwise there is absolutely no problem if you could protect these NH uh, sterically so that you will also get stability in sodium ion. So, these were the, uh, the basic research that we had in our hand uh, before we jumped into this uh, particular field of this porous material. So coming back to it, now if we, if we put all these uh, uh, porous structures like zeolite, porous carbon, and these covalent organic frameworks in one plate, you will see that though we have a crystalline structure, which, uh, so I need, so I understood what I have meant, we have a porous material because eventually we are trying to make a porous material structure and we also made a chemical uh, chemically stable material but we still don't know how to make it quickly and we uh, i still could not figure out how to make it with inexpensive starting materials and so on and so forth so during the time i was uh, digging a little bit into the literature and i figured out that if you look at the morph structures carefully you will see that they have a nice organized crystal faces. You know, those who are working in crystallography know that you can have the face growth, for example, like here, where you have much or significant amount of, in those faces, where you have more number of molecules, ions, will have a much better growth than those faces where you don't have it. So, mm, so like that, the overall growth happens. And that's what the crystal growth, uh, I mean, phenomena. So that is why sodium chloride is cubic, zinc blend, it has a different structure and so on and so forth. So this is the basic feature and there are other factors involved. So MOFs, you could uh, fairly figure it out, but on the, whereas the covalent organic frameworks, you know, they are hexagonal in nature, they're fairly crystalline, and there is absolutely no relationship between the crystal structure towards the morphology. So that was, uh, for, you know, that stri you know, stricken me that why there is no relationship between these. And for example, let's say, you know, I'm taking the same hexagonal structure. Sometimes I get a tube-like architecture. Sometimes I get a sphere-like uh, feature. Sometimes it is hollow sphere also. So I, I could not figure it out. And that's why we decided that let us dig deep and let us try to find out why they behave in that particular way. So we picked up a very simple uh, uh, ship-based compound. It's, uh, and it is fairly stable, though there is no ketoenol tautomerism. So we picked it up because there is, a, uh, there is a very simple intramolecular hydrogen bonding that is involved over here. And that sort of saves it from the hydrolysis, not up to the mark like the ketoenol tautomerized product that I showed you, but a fairly decent. But what interested me is that despite its beautiful you know, powder diffraction data, and which was, uh, which was pretty good compared to the pop structures that we isolated so far with a descent around 2000 meters square per gram uh, surface area. So 
despite all these uh, beautiful things, when we wanted to look at the morphology, we found out that these have this nice spherical, hollow spherical morphology. And we were kind of puzzled because first of all, we didn't see it. Spherical morphology is very common in polymer science. I mean, you will see hundreds and thousands of them. But we never saw it in covalent organic frameworks. And I was pretty surprised that how an hexagonal structure will create this kind of morphology and how, which phases are growing and eventually how this is, this is forming. And, and we figured out after doing a little, uh, uh, little bit of analysis that these structures are actually the covalent organic framework is on the surface or in the, or uh, this is the covalent organic frameworks and the internal space is completely empty, absolutely empty. I mean, you know, uh, except the solvents as and when you, you pour them. Okay, so we looked into a little bit about the crystallization and the process of Oswald uh, ripening. And, uh, you know, so it is a very simple process. And, and most of us know that, uh, that Oswald ripening happens when the smaller crystallites, which has a much higher energy, uh, sort of sacrifice themselves uh, for uh, the growth of a bigger crystallite. So they assemble, uh, self-assemble, and then you get a big, bigger crystal. So same thing, we felt that it is happening, but that does not answer that which crystal faces are growing to form this sphere all on a sudden when this is supposed to be hexagonal in, in, in morphology or at least a plate-like or, or sheet-like structure. So we uh, decided to look into it a little bit more detail with respect to time, you know, so first what we did is we isolated the compound after 12 hours. We did uh, all the studies for including surface area and powder diffraction and other things. And we figured out that the reaction is complete. Reaction is absolutely complete after 12 hours. We got a very beautiful, very high yield and uh, the surface area was also fine. We just kept on going. Uh, nothing changed regarding surface area, nothing changed in terms of crystallinity, but the morphology of the particles kept on changing. Uh, so internal morphology kept on changing though the external properties remain exactly the same. So from 12 hours to 72 hours, it was exactly the same kind of material that we have produced. Okay, so, so that being said, so we took that up uh, into, uh, into the picture. And then what we thought is, all right, so let us try to find out how is it, it is happening. So what we, we decided that time to look into the structure a little bit carefully and step-by-step step analyze it. So first 12 hours. So all these fragmented nice crystallites, so these crystallites which form assembled together because there is aldehyde and amine on the surface. In the, my next slides, I will show you. And these aldehydes and amine sort of haphazardly orient themselves uh, to so that this ship-based reaction on the surface also keep on happening. So that gives you a dense structure. There is nice orientation, as you can see, dense structure, which subsequently recrystallize from the center to the surface and create this nice hollow spherical, spherical structure. So that's intrigued me a lot because it is technically impossible to have uh, a, this such kind of crystal growth, which is happening, which is actually uh, sort of uh, defying the purpose of the crystal growth of the regular inorganic minerals or inorganic salts from where we have learned. So overall, if we understand, try to understand the process, it is very simple. So it uh, forms, as I told you, these haphazard crystallites. And after forming these haphazard crystallites, it goes for an inside out Oswald ripening and forms this hollow sphere. Very interestingly, when we added a little bit of dye over here and took a confocal images, and we figured out that it is our, uh, some biomolecules that the whole biomolecular setup, which we expected to be loaded inside the space, actually got absorbed on the surface, which is porous. We still could not really use the inner hollow sphere or hollow part. We have been trying quite some, for quite some time to do something. So everything gets absorbed on the surface. Nothing remains on the, on the hollow, uh, hollow uh, interior. So that's when uh, my student Himadzi, he thought that if we could take these hollow spheres and assemble them together to something beyond hollow or beyond our gigantic structure, which is something like this. So you take individual sphere, you join it and create an even larger, a larger structure. So how did he do it? So Himadzi, who is about to finish his PhD, took this hollow sphere. So he, he just a simple organic reaction that is happening in, in, in water and the DCM solution. 
So you add a little bit of acid in this particular sequence. You do a little bit of stirring, take it out, and leave it as it is uh, with a little bit of di uh, dichloromethane DCM on the top. And you will see with time this nice covalent organic spheres or covalent organic sphere framework spheres form into start forming, and they start to going towards the surface. So we, we, he could isolate it. Not only that, the beautiful part is they self-assemble one after another. I will show you in a minute. So these spheres, they are very nicely crystalline. Not only that, they are also porous individually. If you could isolate them individually, you just do a centrifuge, you filter them off, and you get these nice spherical particles uh, separated from each other. So you take them, they're very nicely porous, but the most important part is when you leave them uh, into the surface of this uh, DCM and water, then there is a nice surface crystallization happens or, or surface self-assembly happens. And the, from these spheres, they turn into these nice thin films. I would not say they are very thin. The thickness is roughly around uh, 100 to uh, 500 nanometers, but you could even make thinner, but then it will not be self-standing. So uh, it takes about 500 or half a micron thick to have a nice self-standing film. But the self-assembly happens very nicely. If you could coat it on a surface or coat it on a membrane, so then you will have a very nice features exactly like this. You can see that beautiful orientation of this particular thin film. All right, so now uh, moving on, uh, on to that particular uh, aspect. So we, you know, he must be thought that, let us try to understand it, why it is happening. The reason is these spheres, they do have amine and aldehyde stored on the surface of, or, or the unreacted amine and aldehyde on the surface. They start reacting one after another, and then eventually you get this very nice self-standing thin films, which is porous and extremely crystalline by itself. You can, you can deposit it on top of a membrane and you can use it like what we did. We are now working with my colleague, uh, Shantanu Karun and Ullash Karul to find out a little bit more about the gas separation and other things, but they coat very nicely on hollow fiber, regular flat sheet membranes, PAN, and, and so on and so forth. So there is absolutely no problem whatsoever. So that is the point. Now I will, in next five minutes or so, I will change gear. And I will come back to a point about the interfacial crystallization on why did we, uh, why did we thought about it? A few years ago, I visited Tata Steel and where they have, uh, they have showed me their gigantic plants. And this is, the, this is the, where the you know, coal goes to the blast furnace and the water comes out. I mean, they need to keep the blast furnace cool. So the water rolls through the blast furnace and this water contains so much of cyanide and chloride ion that it comes to a particular reservoir where they have to, they have to filter it or they have to remove this, this uh, huge and gigantic amount of water please understand that they cannot throw it, uh, throw the water because then the whole river will go dry because they have to use such a huge amount and this is the pipe to which it is going. So you can imagine that uh, that time it, it strike me that, you know, if we have to fill the pipe and if we use the methodology that we have been doing, uh, joining spheres and so on and so forth, we and our children, our students' children and so on and so forth, we will keep on making covalent organic frameworks. This pipe will never fill. So that is the time we, sh we decided to utilize this uh, interfacial uh, crystallization. The, uh, the idea came from this Andrew Livingstone. And as I told you, Shantanu was a postdoc with Andrew that time, that they have been using this interfacial polymerization for quite some time. So we thought that why don't we use the same methodology to do a simple interfacial crystallization to make this very simple thin films, which we are doing from uh, so far uh, and make it from, uh, from the scratch. So what we did, my student Koshik, he actually picked up some of these uh, covalent organic frameworks and very nicely he has grown these very simple thin films on a interfacial crystallization, starting from absolutely from scratch. So you take, uh, you don't make the covalent organic framework in the beginning. So you just uh, crystallize them one after another uh, into the surface itself. So just simple uh, mix and match. And you took the uh, um, uh, amine on the top layer, Put, it, put the aldehyde on the bottom layer, it comes in contact, it forms an interfacial crystallization and gives you very nice, once again, thin films. So the thickness of this is much more, uh, much more thinner. Over here, I'm showing you a little bit thicker film for the visualization purpose, but we could make roughly from 50 nanometers and go up above, self-standing one still half a micron uh, thicker. And what we figured out that 
the synthesis is is very simple you have the simple salts coming together or the salt molecules coming together aldehyde replace the salt do the reaction and finally form this nice crystalline films and these films uh, the mechanism i will i shall skip it these films as i told you that the thickness is here it is about 2 to 5 micron so you can go on uh, go uh, go up and these are very nicely self standing and you could use lots of different dye molecules and it is very simple because these dye molecules do have uh, their features and and these dye molecules do uh, you know you will see that these dye molecules can be filtered very nicely uh, very nicely over uh, over here uh, will how much time do i have uh, roughly 7 minutes rule okay thank you so uh, pretty good. so this uh, this dye molecules are are pretty easily to uh, separate so and and i believe i mean you would also also believe this is a very simple filtration technique this is a dead end mode not the cross flow technique we are trying to do it with respect to the cross flow technique so this is a simple dead end mode where you have different kind of molecules they have a different kind of molecular weight molecular dimension so the smaller ones will pass through like a filter paper the larger ones on as simple as that that is the concept but overall if you see the idea behind this is if you have a completely crystalline film then the flux and other aspects of it which you don't get an amorphous material will have a tremendous efficiency uh, towards the flux and other things but the challenge being is that to make a roll to roll which in amorphous materials you get here you have a problem because it will have a problem of flexibility so that was the problem that was there in our mind so there has to be some kind of uh, some kind of blending between these materials and the, some of the amorphous polymers that we believe so coming back to it we felt that all right so you know uh, the filter papers that we use regularly in our laboratory those are roughly around 11 to 2 micron uh, I mean, uh, um, with their with their filtration capability you have syringe filters which is nylon made which is much smaller than that uh, smaller than that but what about the nanometer scale can you do a similar kind of filtration because you know the nanoparticles uh, these days are of course you know they are there are hot filled always people always struggle to have a very uniform sized nanoparticle made and separate you know there is always a size distribution so we thought that since these molecules are showing or these membranes are showing this such kind of uh filtration which is based on simple molecular sieving should uh, shouldn't they be uh, used to, for the uh, separation of this nanometer sized or a, or a sort of like different kind of nanoparticle separation simple nanoparticles i mean you know so if we have a let's say 10 nanometer particle or a 2 nanometer particle so the 2 nanometer particle should be separated rather than 10 nanometer so it should happen i mean you know uh, there is really not a thing outstanding over there. so that was koshik's idea and koshik uh, grown this covalent organic framework films once again the self standing one a little bit in different manner as you can see he took the amine solution the aldehyde solution put it into a simple paper plate where we have a nice uh, formed uh, holes and we put it over there you, uh, he filled it up he put it into the oven for some time let's say about uh, half a day you take it out take them out and put it into water to wash off all the acid and other things they are very stable in water tiny amount of hcl will help to wash out all the polymers and you get this nice nice thin film or i would rather not say thin film because they are not that thin uh, but you will get this nice very nice thin structure which is about 100 micron thicker thicker in 100 micron so when you look at the structure a little bit carefully and we figured out that this structures contains of lots of tiny amounts of defect but not in every layer so if the defects in the first layer is not allowed with the second and the third and the fourth so overall there is this nice uh, structural feature where at some point these tiny nanoparticles when you inject them like what we did over here inject them they come in contact with a particular pore which is roughly around 2 to 3 nanometer in size and it passes through so this we tried out uh, we, we we had to do a lot of experimentation because it is not that easy to isolate and characterize this nanoparticle so we had to do uh, we had to characterize it uh, multiple times and we figured out that 
before filtration you have uh, nanoparticles of let's say 5 nanometer 10 nanometer uh, sort of something like that of this size than that and after filtration when you filtrate you get about roughly around 2 nanometer roughly a little bit less than 2 nanometer because the pores are not exactly aligned 2 nanometer they are a little bit largish so roughly around 2 nanometer uh, particles whereas the uh, reject you is is basically basically uh, your uh, around 7 to 8 nanometer sized whatever we started with so we could do this nice uh, filtration and you can regenerate you can just do a backflash and you will get those nanoparticles which are stuck on the pore out and you can even uh, you can even take them out and regenerate uh, the system all right so that's pretty much what i wanted to discuss as i said that uh, we were working with tata steel and some other companies to find out and they need this roll to roll as i told you so what we have been doing is we are taking the aldehyde and the amine and we mix it in and make a slurry out of it we use a, a small amount of paratoluene sulfonic acid today i have i didn't have time to discuss the role of that beautiful reagent and you make a nice uh, slurry you uh, put it on a knife caster you make a self standing and put give a little bit of heat and you make this nice 15 millimeter coupon even you can make it larger nowadays this was pretty old work so uh, make and uh, when you put it into a dead end mode once again this is a dead end mode you will see that it shows a very nice uh, filtration and exactly like the filtration molecular sieving that we told these are the cough layers beautifully aligned one after another that's just now i i showed you many different pictures we could see that they are very nicely aligned and they are they are porous and organized and structured in nature these are the films the porosity of the films please note that this is not a powder you take the film you do a gas absorption analysis without doing anything and you will get this nice porous uh, internal crystalline structure of the films itself we have not done any gazing incidents this is the black brentano geometry so their uh, crystallinity is very nicely ordered throughout uh, x y and and z axis and we did the permeation studies uh, once again i will refrain from going into it as we have ran out of time and we did this molecular separation using these nice uh, films and this is the dead end mode where we use this rose bengal and we are trying to use it for the arsenic separation which is a common problem of west bengal where i am now so that is basically basically what i wanted to discuss and uh, it was very nice uh, talking to all of you and uh, so we i'm looking forward to a lot of collaborations on this because we have we really don't have all uh, facilities and all expertise with us but we can really prepare lots of different kinds of structures for you and if you are interested i will be very happy to collaborate and and discuss with you with these beautiful materials acknowledgement goes to my lab mates all the funding agencies and all my collaborators and once again thanks to will and omar and their team for their for the nice organization thank you so very much okay thank you professor Banerjee, for a wonderful presentation uh, and uh, now we have uh, uh, roughly 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers so again if you have access to uh, audio and video uh, you can raise your hand and i will call on you and you can unmute yourself and uh, we also have some uh, questions uh, in chat and you're welcome to add to that if you were interested so um, we'll we'll start with uh, a question from the the uh, chat from a uh, a commenter named uh, dinesh shetty and uh, dinesh asks um, does the thickness of interfacially synthesized membranes impact the molecular separation efficiency and or selectivity? Have you tried introducing any functionality on the surface of the membrane to uh, introduce selectivity? The thickness, uh, they do not, uh, in, uh, uh, they do not uh, govern or uh, monitor uh, the selectivity or uh, selectivity, but what this thickness does, if you have a much more thicker membrane, then obviously your permeability and diffusivity is, is to some extent compromised. So that's what we have found out. Uh, if it is a self-standing membrane, then if you, you need a thicker membrane, otherwise when you are giving a pressure, uh, then you will have a pinhole or a crack and then uh, the whole thing is compromised. So you need to have a defect-free thick membrane. That is why now we are trying to coat this membrane or, or load these membranes on top of, uh, top of the surface, but that's another uh, different kind of challenge. Uh, mm, yeah, coming back to the uh, to the selectivity, as, uh, as I told you, no, it is not. But if you, uh, as I said, but if you could have a much more thinner membrane, uh, self-standing if possible, 
I would strongly feel that this will have a, in, you know, an excellent flux and excellent uh, permeability. Uh, and that will be a really interesting feature to see. And that could be an interesting feature for a desalination purpose if, if we could have a very thin self-standing membrane. That's what I personally feel. Of course, we have not achieved something like that, but I personally feel that we can. Great, thank you. Um, our next question from the chat comes from uh, Vijaya Kumar. And uh, uh, Vijaya asks, can we expect Oswald ripening leading to 3D structures like polyhedra? Oswald ripening uh, do showcase a different kind of morphologies, whether it is polyhedra or not, I, I cannot answer on top of my mind, but, uh, mm, but I have heard that the Oswald ripening can uh, produce a larger size of particles. Now, whether it is polyhedra or different kinds of things, that will depend on your crystal growth on a particular phase. Because remember, you get the polyhedra, tetrahedra, uh, cube octahedron, like those platonic solids we talk about, we get it uh, when we have a crystal growth on a particular uh, surface. So that particular surface needs to grow. So sodium chloride is a face-centered cubic lattice. That's what I told. And that's why the faces grow very nicely rather than, uh, rather than, so you will have a hard time to make a spherical size, very spherical shaped sodium chloride. Okay. Mm -hmm. So keeping that in perspective, uh, perspective, um, Oswald ripening probably will govern the crystal size or crystal uh, particle size, but whether they will give you the um, different shapes and sizes like uh, um, uh, cuboctahedra, octahedra, or polyhedra, that I'm not uh, not fully sure, and that I do not wish to answer uh, on on blind luck. So, so I need to take a little bit. Uh, if you wish, just send me an email. I'll try uh, try to figure out a little from the literature a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, our next question comes from uh, Biswajit. And uh, the question is, what is the role of paratoluene sulfonic acid in interfacial polymerization and how it helps creating uh, stable self-standing membranes? Okay, so paratoluene sulfonic acid, this we have, as I said, I haven't had an opportunity to discuss that. So what we figured out is that if you have a reactant, uh, for example, the cough, uh, uh, from synthesized from scratch, say uh, the ligands, that is the amine on the top layer, water layer, and the bottom layer is aldehyde, you will have a problem because the amines are not very soluble in water. So how do you make them soluble? You can uh, make, you can add a little bit of tiny amount of acid, that is the, that we know this acid will uh, do a nice acid catalyzed reaction in the ship base. But the problem is the control uh, becomes a problem. So paratoluene sulfonic acid, what it does, when you take a salt of paratoluene sulfonic acid, what we believe is that it actually decreases the, the kinetic barrier for this thermodynamic product. So it, it pushes it down so that you get this polymerization uh, very efficiently, number one. Number two, it forms a very nice soluble uh, salt in water. So your uh, 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 solution, top water solution is homogeneous in nature. That is point number two. Point number three, since it is still salt uh, and hydrated in water, so when the aldehyde comes into the picture, it needs to first break that bond, the amine NH3 plus bond, and it has to have the free amine and then uh, react. That will give you some amount of delay in crystallization. So your uh, polymers or oligomers will have a, a bond making, bond breaking process, and eventually you will have a much more crystalline and nice ordered structure in the interface which otherwise it's a bit challenging. Please understand these interfaces when you keep it in your laboratory or somewhere, there is always a vibration. People are walking, people are going, there are hundreds of things happening. There is always a vibration. So, so it, we may not feel it, but the molecules do. So these materials needs a lot of time for crystallization in order to have this nice crystalline defect-free membranes. And I believe that the paratoluene sulfonic acid helps in that particular process. Great, thanks. Uh, our next question uh, comes from here at Northwestern from uh, Professor uh, Vinayak Dravid. Uh, he types it into chat, so I'll, I'll read it rather than have him uh, ask it again. Uh, he says, uh, intrigued by your TEM images, very nice quality and fidelity. Uh, can you elaborate uh, just a few key details uh, of, of what um, STEM or TEM uh, conditions were used? 
It is a very, uh, so let me put it in this particular way. Uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, the TEM instrument that we have used, it's a very regular HRTEM. We do not have a facility of cryo TEM, neither we have a facility of, uh, of uh, high resolution TEM as well. It's a very simple TEM. I believe what has happened over here and, and for few covalent organic thermals, which we have seen quite routinely, not for all, that the growth of a particular zone or particular portion of this covalent organic framework or for, for some amount of crystal lights is so very uniform and so very organized that you could see these nice hexagonal channels in, and, and the defects, of course, in the, on those channels, very organized in very nice manner. There is nothing intrigued about or nothing, nothing really crisp about the instrumentation. It is just a very routine TEM that we have taken and uh, that got these beautiful, uh, really beautiful images. And uh, that's pretty much it is. And uh, so uh, if these kind of materials intrigued you, intrigued, uh, intrigued you, and I'm really, really impressed uh, about this uh, order, ordered organization and long range periodicity of these materials, uh, that I will, uh, I, will, uh, I, I will be happy to discuss with, discuss with you. No fancy uh, technique over here, absolutely nothing. Great. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Banerjee. We are out of time for questions. 